Nightfall brings many changes to the estuary. Creatures familiar by day disappear, and for many of us, the estuary may even become a bit spooky. But for a scientist willing to venture into the Rachel Carson estuary at night, the darkness may actually reveal much about how this environment works. I've actually been walking around in the Estuary and Research Reserve at night since 1982, uh, year round, because I was really curious about what was out there coming from the Midwest. Uh, and about 1984, I started taking classes out there at night and school children out there at night because it's a fascinating place to, as you see if you go out with me at night, you see there are all sorts of neat things out there. Then about five years ago, I started thinking about quantifying where the animals were out there and just, just how everything worked. Because every year that I walked, I saw similar things in similar places. And I wanted to know how they get there and why they're where they are. Real, real close on its tail. It even has eyes on its tail. And then the technology a couple of years ago became available so we could use satellites and computers and start mapping uh, effectively. It's really hard to map out in a sand flat where everything moves around all the time. So five years ago I started marking the predatory snails and following them around uh, with the satellites. And then last year we added flounder uh, and started marking blue crabs. This flounder is just about a year old. I call it a micro estuary because it has a tiny freshwater input at one end and it has all the life stages of things like blue crabs that are supposed to be spread over, that are spread over five or six hundred miles in the Chesapeake Bay. And they're, they're all compressed in 600 meters in this little embayment. So I thought we could use it, and since you can walk the entire thing at night at low tide, I thought we could use this little tiny model estuary to figure out how animals use, the, uh, use their habitat. So this summer, I'll be working mainly on blue crabs, looking at where the males are that attract females for breeding, where the females go to release their larvae uh, at night or in the morning, uh, and where the little blue crabs live. I've noticed over time that all of these stages live in different places in that little embayment. And we'll be trying to figure out what physical features tell them where they are. Last summer we worked on the flounder and we found out that the flounder go through the embayment like flocks of birds. Uh, in a particular night you'll come and there'll be 10 or 20 flounder in the embayment. You mark all of them, catch them by hand, mark them and let them go, and they leave. And the next time you catch flounder, you catch the flounder in the same place, but they're not the same animals. So that to me is really neat. If we mark flounder here tonight, they might be here tomorrow, but they won't be here in a week. They just keep going on there. When I think about the reserve and its usefulness. I think the value of reserves like this hasn't been reached yet. The potential isn't anywhere near beginning because in order to work effectively in a place like this, you have to have the technology. Uh, my goal for the embayment out there is to ask questions that you could answer on a, a, a computer modeling dimensional scale, to have the tide move in and out, to have all the animals move in a giant real sim life game and like sim city or sim farm except for the fact that every it's all real it's not pretend that's what's really going on out there and all the snaggly teeth that it has are always the